Welcome to Exploring the Scripture Readings for Sunday's Liturgy, Year B, Session 10, the fifth Sunday in Ordinary Time. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us fire of your divine wisdom, knowledge, and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we continue on through year B, we're continuing with the Gospel according to Mark. So it's the year of Mark. There'll be some readings from John throughout the year on special occasions. However, most of the readings for the Gospel will be from Mark, and there'll be one following the other. They're sequential in a sense a continuation of the Gospel of Mark, where we left off last week, we continue this week. And one question that some people ask is, Mark we know is the first Gospel written. It was written about the year 65. Matthew was written about the year 85, and so was the Gospel of Luke. How come Matthew's Gospel comes first in the Gospels in the Bible? The reason is, and at one time, some of the commentators believed that Matthew was the first gospel written and that Mark took Matthew's gospel and synopsized it, left some things out. Where in reality, Mark was the first gospel written and Matthew used it as a source. So Mark did write the first gospel, but the reason they're lined up this way is that when they were putting the line up in the God in the Bible. This is the way they thought things were written. So we've learned things since the Bible has been lined up in a sense. They tried to line things up according to the way they understood them. So that's what the reason for Matthew going first. And so we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So Mark now, year B. One of the things about Mark's gospel, it's a shorter gospel. It's basically the foundation, as I say, for the Gospel of Matthew and Luke. And Matthew and Luke, they have another source besides Mark. So they drew from that source. They drew from Mark to write their Gospel. And they also had a tradition within their own community. They had heard of stories, messages about Jesus that neither Luke nor Matthew nor Mark heard about. And so they put those into each particular story. For instance, Matthew, he had Mark. He had these sayings of Jesus in front of him. They were written, two separate written sources. But he also had stories that he had learned from his own tradition, his own community. And so he added those. So what happens is, for instance, we have now Mark's gospel. Then we have Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel. So in year B, Mark's Gospel. And one of the things we begin with today is the idea of just a little background. It's a story from Jesus. It talks about Jesus. Now he's leaving the synagogue. If you recall from last week, what we had in last week's Gospel was Jesus went into the synagogue. In the synagogue, he preached. They saw this as preaching with authority. He did it on his own. He didn't quote from previous writers or scripture writers or any previous rabbis. And also, too, he performed miracles. But they didn't see it as a miracle. They saw it as a form of teaching. So in the synagogue, they learn a lesson from Jesus. Now what happens, we continue this week from where we left off last week. So on leaving the synagogue, a typical day in the life of Jesus. He goes into the synagogue, he preaches, he heals. Now he's leaving the synagogue. And he goes to the home of Andrew, the home of Simon Peter. Simon Peter talks about Simon Peter's mother-in-law being sick. And the idea behind that, it does tell us that Simon Peter is married. So it's time for Jesus to perform more miracles. But the idea about the readings this week, it really is a reading that talks about hope 
and the reading that talks about discipleship. And as I said before, the first reading very often leads us up into the gospel. It reinforces the gospel, tells us something that the gospel should be also telling us more about. So a reading from the book of Job, the first reading, we'll start with that. For Job, there is a book out that was very popular for many of us, the idea when bad things happen to good people. And we know that bad things do happen to good people. But then there was another writer. He was a psychologist. And he also said it doesn't matter what happens to us. It's how we respond to what happens to us. He's talking about human dignity, the human soul, the human person, the idea of hope. So from the book of Job, the book of Job is one of the wisdom books. That's surprising for many of us to hear that the book of Job is a wisdom book. And really, it talks about suffering. But the book of Job is not really about a person who lived. It's a message. It's a message, a wisdom message that pain, suffering comes into our life. And it doesn't really give an answer to suffering. The book of Job really tells us that God is with us in our suffering. And even in our suffering, we have to have confidence in God. In the book of Job, Job has a wonderful life. Job has everything. God has blessed him with a great farm, many animals, great family, good children. But then the scene shifts to heaven. In those days, they saw heaven as being above the earth. And there in heaven, God is sitting with the heavenly court. And in that heavenly court is Satan. Satan is not evil in this story. Satan is a tempter. And Satan says to God, well, you, God says to Satan, excuse me, first, look how wonderful Job is and how he loves me. And how he's so wonderful to me. And Satan says, of course he is. You've given him everything. And Satan says, let me go and try him. And see if he still loves you. So God gives permission to Satan. To go and be a tempter for Job. The only holdback is that he cannot hurt the person of Job physically. So Satan comes and what happens? Now Job goes through a terrible bit of suffering. His farm is destroyed. His family is wiped out, with the exception of his wife. And his wife begins to turn against him and challenge him. Job has everything going against him. And then there's three friends of Job who come to him and try to talk to him, try to say to him, you know, God is angry with you. And the reason God is angry with you is because you must have done something sinful. And Job, surprisingly, is saying, I never did anything sinful. I don't know why God is doing this to me. And so as we see the story progressing, we see that now Job is a person who is knowing that he's a good person. And yet what's being said here is that he's not a person that is willing to give in and say, yes, yes, I'm a sinner. God must be punishing me as a sinner. It's the idea that God is punishing him because God is testing him. So we see that happening here, and we see God testing him. Excuse me. And so as the testing goes on, we see the... Three friends. The first friend comes and he's telling Job, Job, you've done something wrong. The second one, Job, you, you must have done something wrong. And each time Job would say, no, I didn't. Finally, the third friend does it and Job still refuses to give in. And so Job is facing with all of, faced with all of these things. He's suffering, but he's remaining faithful. And then Job himself, he kind of weakens a little bit and complains to God. He'll say to God, God, why are you doing this to me? He's saying, God, look at what you've done to me. And God becomes angry with Job. God said to Job, where were you when I put the earth in this place? 
where were you when I were you when I held back the waters? And Job says, I put my hand over my mouth. What he's really saying there is I'm I'm shutting myself up. I shouldn't have complained against God. And then what happens, God sees that Job has remained faithful. So God gives Job his family back. He has more sons. He also has a great fam, his family. His arm becomes something wonderful. So Job really now finds himself living in a wonderful life. The one thing to keep in mind when you read the, the story of Job is that the story of Job is a story about a person who doesn't believe in life hereafter. He believes that only, the only mortality comes through offspring and the only blessings that God can give is not life hereafter, but a blessing here in life. So at the end of the story, Job has a wonderful life. Everything is wonderful again. But what we read today is one of Job's very difficult times. It's really a time when he's speaking to one of the people who come to him and, and start to talk to him about, he must have done something wrong. He's telling this person how difficult life is. He seems to have lost all hope. So the first reading, a reading from the book of Job. Job spoke saying, is not man's life on earth a drudgery? Are not his days? those of a hireling. He is a slave who longs for the shade, a hireling who waits for his wages. He, he's like a slave. He's wanting to get out of this hot sun. And he, if he's a worker, he's looking for his wages. That's why he works. The day is long, the day is hard. Life is difficult. So I have been assigned many months of misery, Job says. And troubled nights have allotted me. If in bed I say, when shall I arise? Then the night drags on. The long sleepless nights that Job must go through. And so we see what's happening. Job is really depressed. Job is finding life very, very difficult. I am filled with restlessness until the dawn. How many people toss and turn all night until the dawn? My days are swifter than the weaver's shuttle. They come to an end without hope. That's where Job is. He said his days pass swiftly. His nights are long. He can't sleep. He tosses and he turns. The idea is as we read this, we're meant to pick up the feeling of Job. And he says, it's without hope. So Job doesn't have any hope. When Jesus comes, he gives us hope. But at the same time, we see what's happened here. Job is saying, life is difficult. We need help. And so the gospel will give us this help. And Job says, remember, my life is like the wind. The wind comes and the wind goes. And what does it achieve? I shall not see happiness again. Job is extremely depressed. And so it's a book, a wisdom book, a book about suffering. It's a book that says in the end, for those who remain faithful, that God will give them a reward. And so it's meant to be uplifting in that sense that we get down to the end and say, God is there. God is caring for us. Job, again, the story is about his life here on earth. Everything gets wonderful on earth for Job. But the reality is that we as Christians, we know that we're on our journey. There's times when the journey is difficult. There's times when we feel hopeless. But we're meant to keep our mind on God. To realize God is with us. That's what the Gospels teach us. That's what Jesus teaches us. So there's Job, very depressed. Now we go to the responsorial psalm. So the responsorial psalm is, praise the Lord who heals the brokenhearted. Brokenhearted. Job is brokenhearted. Job is down. 
these drudgery days, they happen to everybody in a sense that there's always those bad days when everything seems to go wrong. So what happens is God is still with us. That's what we're meant to keep in mind. So our responsorial psalm. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praise to our God, for God is gracious. It is fitting to praise the Lord. So through it all, Job really never says, oh, you, you know, to those men who come to him, you're right, I must have committed a sin. Job keeps saying, I didn't do anything wrong. I was faithful. The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem, the dispersed of Israel he gathers. It's a psalm that talks about the idea that God is with the people. Rebuilds Jerusalem. In our current year, we, we put the word church in place of Jerusalem. The Lord be, rebuilds the church. The church goes through bad times, but the Lord rebuilds. The Lord is with it. Then we re repeat our refrain, praise the Lord who heals the brokenhearted. Second verse, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. So the Lord takes care of us. He tells the number of the stars. He calls each by name. God is in control. God knows how many stars there are in that sky. So he's saying, God sees everything. Trust. God breaks, helps us, helps the brokenhearted, and he binds up the wounds of those who are suffering. And then we say, praise the Lord who heals the brokenhearted. Like Job, no matter how bad it gets, God is still with us. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. To the Lord's wisdom, there is no limit. There's no limit to what the God, what God can do. In fact, everything's in the control of God. If we were to create this world, we might create a different kind of world. But to God's wisdom, there's no limit. We have to trust that there's something here that God is pulling us towards. Perhaps the idea of drudgery, difficulties, doubts, perhaps that's our test. The tempter might be trying us. And what we have to do or should do is to try to remain faithful, no matter how difficult it gets. The Lord sustains the lowly. The wicked he casts to the ground. The Lord gives strength to those who are willing to say, God is running my life. I trust God. For the wicked, God is not as kind as that's what the psalm is saying. God will not be as kind to the wicked as to those who really trust God. Job trusted God. He weakened, but he never really sinned. And that's that book of wisdom. He remained faithful. Now we go into the second reading. And the second reading comes from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. In Paul's letter to the Corinthians, Paul is saying, I know I preach the gospel well, but in preaching the gospel, I have no reason to boast. Brothers and sisters, if I preach the gospel, there is no reason for me to boast. For an obligation has been imposed on me, and woe to me if I do not preach it. So he's obliged to preach it. God has blessed him. And what he's saying is God has given him this blessing. And to look at it from the angle of a disciple, God has called all of us to certain things in our life, certain ways of acting. We all have certain talents. So what Paul is saying, his talent, his gift, his call is to preach the word of God. So he has a choice. He says, if I do so willingly, I have a recompense. If I'm happy to preach the gospel, I, I have a good gift. I have a recompense. But if unwilling, if I do it as a drudgery, as something I don't want to do, I don't want to use my talents, then I have been entrusted with a stewardship. Paul is saying, I'll do it. But in that case, if I don't feel like doing it, 
I'm doing it more like a, a steward. I'm doing it because I'm a slave in a sense. So he's saying, if I'm happy to do it, I'm rewarded. If I'm not happy to do it, then I'm just simply a steward who's carrying out my duties. So if I'm a steward who does it unwillingly, he's saying, what then is my recompense? What do I get back? So when I preach, I offer the gospel free of charge so as to make full use of my right in the gospel. So he's offering that he's willingly giving his gospel. He's willingly giving the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. Although I am free in regard to all, I have made myself a slave to all so as to win over as many as possible. Paul has willingly accepted his call of servanthood. He's willing to be a slave in the sense, willing to be a servant to everybody, willing to preach God's message no matter what happens. And he says to the weak, I became weak to win over the weak. There are times in Paul's ministry when the people aren't eating certain things because it's been offered to the false gods. Paul is able to say, there, is, there are no false gods. I believe that. But if the people don't believe it yet, then Paul is saying, I'm willing to join with them so I don't scandalize them. To the weak, I become weak. So he's saying, I'm going to be with them even in their weakness, even in their doubts. I have become all things to all to save the least. All this I do for the sake of the gospel, so that I too may have a share in it. So what he's saying is, I don't just preach the gospel, I live the gospel. I live the gospel that says, for those who are weak, I'm willing to become weak. He says also, for those who are strong, I'm willing to become strong. He's willing to be a servant of the people, discipleship. So. Paul here is not talking about how he feels about things, except to say, I'm grateful that God called me to preach the gospel. And I'm successful at times, but I don't boast. Boasting is something that says, I did this myself. The reality is everything we have comes from God. Now we come to the gospel. So everything is leading up to the gospel, and we now read the gospel and see, well, what did Jesus do? How did Jesus encourage us? How does Jesus tell us about discipleship and carry us through all of this? So the gospel, on leaving the synagogue. So we recall that Jesus was in the synagogue. He healed. The people were amazed at his teaching. Now he's leaving. He entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. In Mark's gospel, Jesus has chosen his first four disciples. He walked along the shore. He chose Peter and Andrew, James and John. So now they're his disciples. They're with him. Simon's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever. They immediately told him about her. Right away, our minds say, well, what, what, what's wrong here? Of course, in those days, in the day of Jesus and that era, people with fevers very often died. They didn't know what caused fevers, and they didn't know how to cure fevers. And so what happened is she had a fever. They immediately told him about her. They also saw fevers as a punishment from God, as though the person was possessed. So it could be a warning in any way. Be careful, you don't want to get the fever, but it could be also, be careful, you don't want the demon to touch you and to change you and to condemn you also. He approached, grasped her hand and helped her up. The idea again, some simple sentence. This time he grasped her hand. When Jesus first went into the synagogue, he went into the synagogue, he spoke and he healed. But he didn't touch anything. He didn't touch the man who was possessed. Now he touches the woman. He grasps her hand. Jesus doesn't just heal by word. 
he heals by touch and helps her up. Jesus comes and raises us up. Jesus himself was raised up, resurrection. It could be an allusion to baptism, raising us up. We have translations and sometimes in translations, we miss the full meaning of the message. And so he helped her up. That meant he raised her up. She was cured. Then the fever left her and she waited on them. So it was like the demon was cast out. And what happens after the demon is cast out, after we're blessed by God, after we're raised up? She became a disciple. She waited on them. So we see all those things very subtly put into this reading in the gospel. It's a reading of hope that Jesus comes, Jesus raises us up. So as time goes on, the day continues, she's serving them. Now evening comes. First day that we see about Jesus, he's beginning his public ministry. So it's in the evening, when it was evening after sunset, they brought to him all who were ill or possessed by demons. People who were sick or possessed by demons. That seems to be those who were having some mental difficulties, emotional difficulties. So they were brought to Jesus. The whole town was gathered at the door. He cured many who were sick with various diseases. So sick. And in our day, we say, well, he, he was just simply helping them. But at the same time in that day, it was saying he cured, he cast out evil spirits. And he drove out many demons. He's not permitting them to speak because they knew him. One of the things we find in Mark's gospel is what's called a messianic secret, a secret that Jesus was the Messiah. Some of the commentators trying to understand why Mark so often is saying Jesus doesn't allow the evil spirits to, to tell, to identify him. In Mark's gospel, it's only the evil spirits who really recognize Jesus. It takes time very much gradually. The disciples will recognize Jesus. But it's really his passion, death, resurrection, and ascension. All of these together that fulfills his role as Messiah. So what Mark is saying here, Jesus doesn't want the people to recognize him. Another aspect is they also were looking towards someone to lead them against the Romans. They wanted a warrior leader. Someone to lead them in war, rebellion, take over, get their land back. To them, the Romans were a foreign conqueror. But at the same time, throughout Mark, we have what's called the messianic secret. Several times, Jesus doesn't allow them to identify him as the Messiah. And so he drove out many demons, not permitting them to speak because they knew him. So that Jesus finally gets to death. He's working hard. We can see that Jesus gives his whole day to healing, to bringing people to club, love him, know him, raising them up, and spending a normal day in the sense of saying, well, then he probably ate. But then the people came out, and he still didn't say, I'm tired, let me go. The people came to him, and he worked with them in a sense, spiritually, healing them and casting out demons. So the day ends. You can presume Jesus goes off to bed. The others go off to bed. Rising very early before dawn, Jesus left and went off to a deserted place where he prayed. He went into meditation. One of the things about Jesus, of course, is that Jesus is God. Who does God pray to? Does God pray to God? But the answer there, of course, is that if we read the other areas in the scriptures, we learn that Jesus emptied himself of his God powers, that Jesus took upon himself our human nature fully without stopping to be God, without stopping as God. In other words, he was always God. He, he couldn't get rid of that. But somehow he emptied himself of his God power. 
the ability to act as God. And so it happens now. He prays as any human being would pray. He asks God help. He's asking, really he's saying, I turned everything over to God. Now I'm asking God's help. So Jesus doesn't pray to himself. He's praying for the idea that he needs guidance just as human beings need guidance. So rising very early before dawn, he left and went to a deserted place where he prayed. Again, keeping in mind, Jesus really is the exemplary disciple, a disciple of God's presence in the world. Simon and those with him pursued him. Mark right away has seen Simon as the central character. So Simon and those who were with him. He didn't name them all, but he talked about Simon. They pursued him. And on finding him, they said, everyone is looking for you. They're excited. They're excited because they're popular. They're a friend of this person whom everybody is flocking to. All the people have come and they're looking for Jesus. He's popular. But Jesus didn't come for acclamation during his life. He came to share the word of God, to share the kingdom of God with the people. And so what was happening is that Jesus was not one who was, as Paul says, he didn't come to boast. Jesus came to share a message, a message for discipleship. Discipleship is not a call to boast about what we do. It's the idea is to do the work of God. So they say, everybody's looking for you. They're excited. Jesus tells them, let us go on to the nearby villages that I may preach there also. What happens? Jesus doesn't go back for the applause. He doesn't go back for the praise. He's not looking to be praised. He has a mission. So he doesn't go back to receive all this acclamation. Let us go on to the nearby villages that I may preach there also. He has a focus. What does prayer do? Prayer keeps us focused. Jesus says, for this purpose have I come. I'm going to other villages to preach there also. For this purpose I have come. I came for this purpose. And so Jesus here is saying, my ministry is to share with others. And he's not going to lose the focus of his ministry to receive praise, to stop and be praised for it. So he went into their synagogues, preaching and driving out demons throughout the whole of Galilee. Second day in the life of Jesus, he now moves on. And he moves on because in prayer, he realized that he was there to preach God's word. That was his focus. That was his purpose. For this purpose have I come. The message for us as disciples of Jesus is that we can be like Job occasionally. We can see that the world does get difficult. Things get bad. We have drudgery like Job did. We can say, God, where are you in all of this? But then to keep our focus. Prayer keeps our focus. It helps us to realize that God is with us. God is in control. Really trust that God is here. No matter how bad things might become, God is with us. And so for this purpose, we're meant to reflect Christ in our way of life. For this purpose have I come for this purpose as God called me. Being a disciple doesn't mean we have to walk around and preach about Christ. That's not our call all the time. Our call is to reflect the love of God in all that we do. To reflect the fact that God is present in our hearts and to act with that. So the idea behind it, Jesus comes as a healer, heals Peter's mother-in-law, which tells us that Peter was married. And then what happens is he continues his ministry. No matter how exhausting it might be, he's faithful to his ministry. 
But then also he has to remind himself and keep reminding himself about what his ministry is. Keep his focus on his ministry. So he goes into prayer. And then in prayer, he can say, for this I have come. Let us move on to other villages. Let us keep sharing God's word. Let us not get encased in all the praise that happens. Being a disciple is being a servant. But at the same time, a servant in our form of life. Parents, their disciples, when they take care of their children, take care of their families. People who work in construction, their servants, their disciples. It means in everything we do, we keep our focus on God. Job said life's a drudgery, but he kept his focus on God. And so we see today's readings, they're talking about two things. Discipleship and being a disciple. Filled with hope. And so as we continue on our journey through the gospel, we recognize that God is with us. We're called to serve God in this world. And that prayer meditation helps us keep our focus on God's presence in the world. May the light of Christ lead me, the power of Christ be with me, the wisdom of Christ inspire me, the word of Christ instruct me, the shelter of Christ protect me, the hand of Christ hold me, and the love of Christ be in me. May the grieving find support in me, the sad find joy in me, the depressed find hope in me, the weak find strength in me, the doubters find faith in me, the rejected find love in me, and the world find Christ in me. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.